coming up next, you know who it is. <laughs> Bill Nye. Bill Nye. Yes, awesome. Bill Nye, uh, who is just, yeah, he's just everything that we're trying to be. It was funny. Uh, Bill Nye apparently met Dr. Carl for the first time. And uh, Dr. Carl said, uh, I'm the Bill Nye of Australia. And Bill Nye said, that's funny, because I'm the Dr. Carl of America. <laughs> Classy guy. Here is his. We're going to be set in just one second. Oh, yeah, perfect. This is Melissa, by the way, who's kicking ass the entire weekend. She is awesome. She's the one that fixes the stuff that explodes, and she's just awesome. So, Bill Nye. All right, here we go. Here's his limerick. Now, just keep it cool. Really try. Don't lose it and go all awry. But as a fan, I'm shaking. Think of the effort it's taking to not just shout out, It's Bill Nye! It's Bill Nye! Well, ladies and gentlemen, Bill Nye. Thank you, George. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Carry on. Wow. I love you guys. Greetings. Wow. Thank you so much. It's so good to see you all. Uh, it is an honor to be here. Uh, I'll just start with this. Uh, a rabbi, a Catholic <laughs> priest, and an ayatollah go into a bar. And the bartender says, what, is this a joke? <laughs> Sorry. Funny, funny to me. Sorry. <laughs> you guys, it's great to see you all. Uh, I, I, uh, I don't know if you guys heard about this, but earlier this year I did a debate uh, in Kentucky. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, congratulations to Jeannie. She, uh, if you will, saved my life. I thought, at first I was overconfident. I thought, I can handle this. And then I got to thinking about it, and I realized it's going to end my career. And then... <laughs> And then I've, I went to the uh, National Center for Science Education, went to NCSE. Jeannie and Josh spent a lot of time with me, and it came, you know, it came out, if I may, all right. <clears throat> now, well, thank you. But listen carefully, everybody, because there's a substantial fraction of you who thought, this is the worst thing you could possibly do. This is the worst approach you could ever take. You should never go into the lion's den with a creationist. They're going to do the gish gallop. They'll make you look like a fool. And indeed, your career will be over. And here's what I would say to you. You may be right. <laughs> you may be right. Time will tell. So I started out by reminding everybody there are billions, billions of people around the world who are deeply religious who do not think the Earth is 6,000 years old. And they conduct their lives, and it's OK. I mean, they are enriched by their communities. And uh, if I may, who am I to judge? Well, that's, I'll tell you who we are. Yeah. <laughs> but this kind of started many years ago. In uh, 2006, I was at uh, McLennan Community College because of um, the rich tradition in South Texas of Scottish uh, ancestry. Uh, but there is, and the McLennans are there. And if you recall, I, uh, I pointed out that the, um, the fir in, at least in the American English version of the Bible, uh, it says that the God made the sun to light today and the moon to light tonight. And I pointed out it's not clear that the author of that really got, really understood that the moon reflects light. It doesn't make its own light. And at that point, a woman grabbed her kids literally by the wrists, took, pulled them out, and explained that she couldn't sit there because she believes in God. And so then the moon does make its own light or something. Uh, and this was sort of, if, as is so often the case, not really an, off, an offhanded remark, but a heartfelt one. And uh, so one thing has led to another, and I sat on the plane today with an evangelical woman who asked me over and over again, well, what if somebody could come back from the dead, and so on. And just, uh, I mentioned this because I showed her this on my laptop right as we were landing. I said, how do you account for all these skulls found all over the world? Does everybody know where we are? 
uh, we are right there. And this one, that's, uh, that's my old boss. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, I think he's still using it, but that's representative. And then, because uh, you guys, I'm just starting out briefly talking about me. <laughs> so this all started a couple years ago almost uh, when I was in New York talking about something entirely different, the flipped classroom. I don't know if you're familiar with this idea. It is getting some traction. Some studies have been done where you, you watch some lecture at home uh, the night before. That's part of your homework on your, your laptop, your tablet your smartphone, what have you. Then when you go to school, the teacher uh, has more time to spend with you, the student, because he or she, you've watched the lecture before. It's good for about a minute a grade. So if you're in second grade, you can watch about two minutes before you start to like totally freak. And then if you're a senior in high school, you can watch about 15 minutes. But after that, it's not effective. Anyway, then this big think company asked me, about creationism, and I said, well, it wouldn't matter, as you may know, it wouldn't matter except for the kids. We can't raise a generation of science students who's scientifically illiterate. And this remark led to one thing after another. If you look down there, uh, I, I circled it. It's had six and a half million views as of this morning. And once again, heartfelt remark, uh, but somewhat offhanded. And one thing led to another, and our good friends at Answers in Genesis pursued me, wrote a letter, I wrote back, wrote a letter, went around for, for almost a year, and then eventually I got to thinking about it and I agreed to do it. And this is a picture of me on stage with our good friend Ken Ham. And uh, as of this morning, this had over three million views. And so the, uh, the question, if you remember, was does the, Ken, does the Ken Ham's creation model hold up? Is it viable? And for me, this was really uh, an important negotiating point because uh, it was about then Ken Ham's model. It wasn't about the Bible. It has no uh, connection at all, at least for me, with the New Testament. It was about this particular brand of creationism. And look, everybody, he's not messing around. The Earth's not 10,000 years old. Okay, anybody could do that. No, it's six. <laughs> okay, so, I mean, cutting it in half again like, is like very aggressive. And if you recall, uh, Noah's Ark was just 4,000 years ago, which is, I mean, <laughs> Mr. Ham, really, dude, <laughs> really. And so uh, don't worry, he was surrounded by, you know, a lot of believers in his ministry and stuff. But the, if you're not familiar with it, it's a new tactic, at least for me. Now, I know Jeannie and um, Josh and you all are, might be really familiar with this approach, but I had never heard of it. Ken Ham has kind of a double-speak or Orwellian uh, approach. He has this thing he calls historical science versus uh, observational science. So if you didn't see it, it didn't happen. And this is an extraordinary point of view. And make no, um, don't, don't kid yourself. Their ministry is out to indoctrinate young people. In fact, Mr. Ham kvetches online, if you watch any of his videos, about how young people are not participating in his ministry the way they used to, and what can we do about it. And of course, not of course, but not surprisingly perhaps, uh, the approach has been to just work harder at it, just to indoctrinate these guys harder at it. And uh, I said, what would you be doing if you weren't here in, in that time, Petersburg, Kentucky? That's right, you'd be watching Petersburg CSI. That's right. <laughs> there, is there Las Vegas CSI? There is, right? Yeah. yeah. And is there Sparks? <laughs> Spar is there uh, Virginia City CSI, Virginia City? Uh, these are uh, towns in Nevada. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, I made the point that our whole society re relies on science, the, the body of knowledge, and especially the process of science. And what surprised me at that thing, as you may know, there are about two dozen people who were strangely on my side. <laughs> like, whoa, how did you guys get tickets? The tickets sold out. 
Uh, they sold out in two minutes. Uh, it was really something. And uh, if you don't mind, and if you do start texting or whatever, tweeting, whatever the kids do, uh, you know, I see many of you with the electric computer machines. Uh, uh, I'll just go over a couple things that were not only, to me, important, but they were also kind of fun. Uh, here's the famous painting of Noah's Ark where the animals are with great discipline lining up. Sure, there's a lamb eating some grass. Uh, but the premise of the bit, as we say in comedy, is that you'd have a 500-foot boat, you'd have eight zookeepers, 14,000 individuals, the animals, and then every plant on Earth would be underwater for a year. And I don't know how much you do, how much gardening you mess with, but <laughs> that's really a long time. And so um, I pointed this out to the audience. But you know, if you're a believer, this doesn't mean much. But uh, this was uh, another fun one. It's been 4,000 years since Ken Ham's flood. And so there are 7,000 kinds. Now, this is something that Jeannie and Josh and you guys who are into this are all very familiar with, but I hadn't spent that much time with it. I had to, do, had to catch up quickly. And you, Bill, when are you going to catch up? No, I'm still working on it. But what he's got is 7,000 kinds, and this is somehow inferred from uh, the Bible as written in English today in America and U.S. And uh, the 7,000 kinds then have led to the 16 million species we have today. Now, I chose 16 million because I felt that it's a memorable number. And it's based on a little algebra I did. But you guys, when we start counting all the viruses that are at sea and just the beetles that we haven't found, <laughs> 16 million is very conservative. I mean, it's certainly 50 million. It might even, if you start counting viruses and phages and so on, it might be much closer to 100 million. So if you have 15 million, and then I subtracted the 7,000 for fun. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you're into significant digits. It was fun. It, you know. uh, I subtracted uh, the 7,000, and then you get 4,000 years, and 365 and a quarter. It's not quite a quarter. There's 11 minutes unaccounted for deal. <laughs> Then you'd need 11 new species every day. Not, okay, not 11 new animals or plants that you notice every, 11 new species every day. I mean, wouldn't the you know, local paper mention this? It's like, <laughs> there is, hey, today. And uh, for reasons that have largely to do with my older brother and learning the alphabet, and I love them, but the word aardvark to me is just charming. <laughs> so I put an aardvark in there. And uh, the red snouted taper, that's a little tip of the hat to 2001 Space Odyssey. And the naked mole rat is a reference to the Science Guy show. Uh, the great tufted snipe, if anybody was a Boy Scout and went on a snipe hunt. And then I just slipped in, if I may, Dawkins macaque, just for fun. <laughs> And I point out that I made it, or I sought to make it fun for me, because this thing took tremendous concentration, everybody. I mean, I, many of you wrote to me, and I appreciate it, but there's this thing, there's this time over and over again where you're just like, whoa, wow, you, they trust you to drive? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, he's from, Mr. Ham is from Australia, where they drive on the other side. You know, and, but some of the, these extraordinary things that this uh, ministry embraces, really troubling. And then I hope somebody went to see it. It was a little weird. Uh, the film came out. Did anybody see it? Yeah, anyway, if you didn't see it, there's, they have these magic trees that strip the the branches off of uh, magic tree ghosts that uh, strip the branches off of, they make lumber, and then uh, the eight unskilled family members could build an ark. It just, uh, it wasn't, it's just a new part, a new feature. 
Uh, then um, uh, you may, if you've never been to the uh, Creation Museum, and I got to say, uh, I'm, I've worked for a long time in children's museums and uh, science centers. I've never, uh, I've never seen a museum that was all that had no artifacts. You know, the, you know, I'm not kidding. He, along with this idea of historical science and observational science, the sort of double speak terms. He uses the term museum for a place that has nothing from the past. They're all um, animatronic dinosaurs and stuff. And uh, Eve is, and Ad Adam's a very good looking young man, and Eve's kind of hot. Uh, <laughs> and they're, 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 they're robot guys. And um, it is a charming turn of events. Uh, Don Prothero, I must thank him, he's probably here. I love you, man. Don Prothero and Michael Shermer really helped me out. They really coached me. Don, he was quite the geologist, and he, um, well, hey, you know, Mammoth Caves in Kentucky, Bill, dude. So Mammoth Caves is layers and layers and layers of limestone, and the building is made largely of limestone. And I pulled over on the side of the road, Route 69, an interstate, and picked up three rocks where they'd some, uh, our, uh, um, Highway employees had done some blasting, and I picked up three pretty good-sized pieces of limestone, and there were some shelly fossils right there. I mean, they were, they're not hidden. They're just every piece of rock you pick up in Kentucky has a fossil in it. <laughs> no, really. I mean, and it's, not, it's quite an irony. And so that those guys uh, build this building and live their lives without any acknowledgement of it. It's really, uh, I mean, it's, it's laughable, and it's inane or silly, but it's also a little creepy. You know, where you have uh, raising a, a generation of science students without any knowledge of uh, their homeland. Then it was fun for me to talk about the top minnows. And if you guys don't know top minnows, who doesn't? Uh, they're very cool. And there was a fabulous uh, study done by Bob um, Vrienek. I'm not, I don't speak Dutch. Vrienhoek. Um, who found that when the certain populations are isolated and they don't have enough reproductive or don't have as much reproductive opportunity as they might otherwise, they start reproducing asexually. And then when they get uh, some variety back in the mix, they go back to producing sexually. And if you're not hip, this is the, the theory of the Red Queen, where uh, Alice is, is in, uh, in Through the Looking Glass. She's not in Alice in Wonderland, and she meets the Red Queen. And the Red Queen, and no, I'm not an expert. I'm, I'm not a biographer of Lewis Carroll, but apparently he smoked dope <laughs> and, and stuff. I mean, um, and so she's some sort of red, a chess piece queen person thing. And when you're with her, she's sliding. The whole world is sliding along, and you have to run to keep up with her. Uh, otherwise, you fall off, and Alice says, uh, you know, where I come from, if you run all day, you, you end up somewhere else. <laughs> and the, queen, the Red Queen says, that seems very, very slow sort of country, but uh, that apparently is how evolution is. If you, if you don't continually come up with a new mixture of genes, you'll fall off the treadmill, and you, the treadmill of life, and your enemy is not, as you might think, uh, lions and tigers and bears which are, yes, which are troublesome uh, at best. Uh, they'll kill you. Uh, but your real enemy is germs and parasites. And that's where the, the, um, the uh, top minnows really revealed this with the cysts that um, uh, Bob uh, Rinhook, uh wasn't even sure of the genus. They're so, the cyst is so common. And then I pointed out to people in the audience that um, uh, there's a lot of talk in creationism about gaps. And uh, whenever there's a gap, and we or scientists fill the gap, what then you've done is create two more gaps on either side <laughs> of the thing you filled. And I talked about Tiktaalik, who is uh, this fabulous uh, fish lizard guy or gal that lived in uh, what's now Canada. It was a different government, I think. Uh, 350 million years ago, 325 million years ago. And these researchers went, figured this animal must have existed. They found this Devonian swamp fossilized in uh, northern Canada. And they went there and they found the fossil. I mean, that is just 
just cool. That is just, yes, applaud, yes. It's just cool. And I just, I just mentioned the word audience. Everybody, I strongly believed that my audience was not Mr. Ham. It was not his ministry, except to a limited extent. There were some young people there from his ministry. But my audience was everybody online. I, I got to tell you, I cannot get over how many people have come up to me. I was in the airport today. I was on the plane today. I was everywhere. People who watched that debate. It's just a striking thing. And I guess the reason is this issue of whether or not evolution is as true as gravity is still a, in doubt in people's minds. And so this, I claim that doing this debate, going into the lion's den, is raising awareness, and I hope soon we will reach a tipping point on science literacy. And then, uh, well, thank you. I love you guys. I love you guys. No, that's so nice. So uh, this map is from the Answers in Genesis website, but I embellished it. Uh, I don't know if you, how much you know about the biblical story, but the, this boat is supposed to have run aground at Mount Ararat, and then kangaroos and all the marsupials of that kind who survived the year at sea with no zookeepers or food or place to put the poop uh, <laughs> then ran or, got, or hopped from Mount Ararat to Australia across a land bridge which isn't there. And so there's no uh, kangaroo fossils anywhere here. Now, this to me would kind of do it, yeah? We wouldn't have to go <laughs> any farther. But no, they keep going. Uh, I lived in Seattle for many years. And I was a young guy. And, Seattle, yeah. And uh, Phil Haldeman of the Northwest Skeptics really got me involved uh, long ago. And thank you, Phil, out there. Uh, uh, it got me involved in skeptical thinking. But when you're a young guy, you live in Seattle, I went mountain climbing quite a bit, or hiking in the, on steep snow. And I don't know what you know about Mount Ararat. I mean, it is serious business. <laughs> If you're a kangaroo, you don't get off a boat on the top of this thing <laughs> and go running down. These hikers are on an expedition. It's penguin tours. It's penguin travel. It's very cool. I've thought about doing it. It looks like, seriously, you guys, pretty straightforward climbing, but it's a long day. I mean, it's a long day on, on snow and then steep snow. And so um, just this alone would kind of make me stroke my chin, yeah? But no, they press on. Then I brought up... Uh, from my little world of the Planetary Society and uh, astronomy. My father was quite the amateur astronomer. But uh, if you f we find stars significantly farther away than 6,000 light years, I mean, millions of light years away. And if that were true, how do we see all this starlight then unless light traveled faster than the speed of light? And I got to tell you, I could see it. That line of reasoning was too much for him. I mean, what do you mean? No, you see, if a star is <laughs> millions of light years away, and it's only been 6,000 years, the light wouldn't be here yet. You know, it's a science fiction thing. And so uh, it was really, that was quite a moment for me on stage. I could tell this was a little beyond a lot of people. And uh, my sister went to college in Danville, Virginia. And Danville, I don't know if you know anything about it, it's where Dan River Fabrics used to be. And it's one of America's li most livable cities. And she's never left. And just a few blocks from her house is a church uh, with a marquee or a, to a marker, a, yeah, marquee, a signboard, signage. And it's hard to read because I took this picture with my phone at night, sorry. Big Bang Theory, you've got to be kidding me, God. Why would he kid about something like that? <laughs> or she? Why? Why would some entity make all this stuff up? Just because it's beyond what you might think at first. Like the 6,000 year starlight thing. Doesn't mean it didn't happen. And so I presented, I, I interviewed uh, Bob Wilson, uh, who was one of the discoverers of the microwave background radiation. This is really quite a thing, everybody. You know, people did these, uh, astrophysicists did these calculations predicting that if there had been a Big Bang, 
oh, except it's in outer space. It just goes. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> in fact, it's not even space. I don't know what it does. It, 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 so uh, there would be this hiss, this microwave background hiss. And these are the two guys who had the horn, and now a historic, National Historic Site, in Basking Ridge, New Jersey. And they found the hiss trying to listen to other uh, radio signals in our solar system. Uh, and uh, it was really quite a thing that I included this graph without any information, but the dots line up with the red line, uh, which is my way of showing that the, it matched the predictions exactly to extraordinary accuracy. And this sort of thing is just not much, Ken Ham is not much for this. So at the end I said, is Ken Ham's mo uh, model, creation model viable? And I, you know, this animation is on keynote. No, <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> but when it really came down, everybody, it was something, if I may, why didn't I think of that? Someone in the audience, and, I, and she wrote me and I wrote back, it was really nice. Somebody in the audience submitted this question card. And she checked for uh, Mr. Ham, Mr. Ham, but it could have been either one. What, if anything, would ever change your mind? And that really is the essence of this problem. What would change your mind? I don't want to shock you, uh, but Mr. Ham said, I can't prove it, but basically God and Jesus, the Bible is the word of God. Nothing would change his mind. Nothing. Nothing. Can you imagine if this guy was on a jury and you were on trial or his congregation or ministry? No, oh, they've made up their mind. Cool. Great. I mean, can you imagine? Are they qualified? I mean, it's really an amazing thing. And these people have driver's licenses. They pay taxes. They're, I presume they're allowed to vote. It's really quite a point of view. And so don't worry, I went on about if we just had one piece of evidence, like if we had the fossil that caught drowning between layers in the Grand Canyon, if we had some way to get the speed of light to overcome and get that light from distant stars here, if we had some way that somebody built a wooden boat longer than any ever in history with just eight people who were skilled, or some way to keep uh, 14,000 animals alive for a year on a boat, or some way to keep trees that are 6,500 years old. Okay, wait. If the trees are 6,500 years old, <laughs> keep them alive underwater for a year. So it was really, and then a lot of cartoons were thrown around. Uh, these aren't our words, literally. Uh, but the, the idea was about the same. And I, if you don't know, I was on John Oliver's show. <laughs> yes, listen. I love you guys. And it was the same premise. The, here's 97 climate scientists versus you three. And uh, here's scientific evidence. And you have this book as translated in American English. OK, so on. And so um, what really kicked it in, though, for me, a lot of people said, Bill, you know, if you go down there, Bill's my name, uh, if you go down there, <laughs> Uh, if you go to Kentucky, that part of Kentucky, people are going to be very critical of you. You know, you're going to get a lot of heat. You better watch out. And so we, my agent insisted that we have metal detectors, like at a rock concert. But what really kind of kicked it in, this was all over the Internet the next day. Bill Nye, the science lie. <laughs> you laugh, but... You know, this shows you the antagonism. Somehow, by, by discrediting me, the Earth will be 6,000 years old, <laughs> and science won't be true, and so on. It's really easy to get carried away with this, and it wouldn't matter. I mean, it's just a niche. It's just a few thousand people with, if I may, a few millions of dollars building this eccentric facility in this beautiful part of the, of the U.S., uh, right across the Ohio River from Cincinnati. You know, it's, a, it's a pastoral, it's a horse racing, it's lovely, it's Kentucky bluegrass, it's great. It wouldn't matter. They would be isolated and they, we'd worry about the science students and so on. But it gets more serious than that. Uh, Ken Ham on Answers in Genesis whimsically provides videos, which he, I'm sorry, whimsically calls Answers with Ken Ham. And he says, 
uh, I don't believe in climate change. The earth is now cooling again. And this is where he crossed the line for me. Sorry, climate change is very, very serious business. And if you're going to indoctrinate a ministry or a congregation, and especially the young people, that it's somehow okay to deny the overwhelming evidence for climate change, that's when you, that's when, uh, that's when I'm rolling up my sleeves. And so I don't know how into this you are, but in the United States, we have this unique position of an extraordinary number of prominent people who deny climate change. Now, you guys, you'll hear people say, we've got to save the Earth. Well, as you, if you just stop and think for a moment, the Earth's going to be fine. <laughs> the Earth is going to be here no matter what we do. No, I want to save the Earth for me, <laughs> the human. All right? I mean, look, some of my best friends are humans. Of, <laughs> my parents were humans. My old boss, of course, I was never sure. And I'll just tell you guys, I go way back with this. This is my first kid's book in 1993. I did a demonstration about climate change. I did it on a show in 1994. I did it on Stuff Happens in 2005. I go on the air all the time, like with John Oliver, talking about climate change. And so to have these guys running around saying that it's not happening is not in anyone's best interest. Then, there was a moment that means something to me. Uh, he's not on the air anymore, but Pierce Morgan said to Mr. Ham right after the debate, uh, it's true you don't believe in climate change. And then Ken Ham said roughly, I, I never said that. And I said, actually, you did. You say it all the time, actually. And I caught him, and there's the same hand motion. There, proof. <laughs> and uh, I remind everybody, uh, Mr. Ham is not from the US. And I know many of you are not from the U.S. Welcome. I love you all. We're humans. But when you grow up in the U.S., you don't know any better. You, we grow up thinking we could be president. We think, cool, the U.S. is great. And so uh, in the U.S. Constitution is the, oh, shoot, heavens. In the U.S. Constitution is the charge for our Congress to promote the progress of science, and the useful arts. When we go to the voting booth, that's what we think we're promoting. That's what we believe we're doing. The only thing that keeps the United States in the game, economically, everybody, is innovation. The United States doesn't make that much stuff on our own soil anymore. My clothes, very few of them, are made in the US. And we wear them, and it's OK, because we hire that out, if I can speak we, broadly we, as a mechanical engineer who grew up in the United States. And by the way, 45th anniversary of the moon landing uh, next week. Don't miss it. Celebrate. Uh, this, uh, this is what keeps us viable in the world economy, is our ability to innovate. So if we raise a generation of Kentucky, Southern Ohio, Tennessee, Oklahoma, Texas kids who are not scientifically literate, that is a formula for disaster. Now, thank you, thank you. I'm not trying to wear you out. Thank you. It's really nice. But when you look at a picture like this, which is taken with spaceships, everybody. <laughs> no, we, it's common now, right? I mean, how much, if your cell phone doesn't tell you which side of the street you're on, you're like, what's going on? What's wrong with this thing? Yeah. <laughs> Information comes largely, not directly, but largely from outer space. The towers for your cell phone are put there with global positioning to within a few centimeters. Anyway, when you look at a picture like this, it looks like the Earth is out of focus. Now, to be sure, I've stretched it. The clouds are destroyed a little bit. It's not out of focus. It's that the atmosphere is so extraordinarily thin. If we had an extraordinary car that we could put on an extraordinary road and drive straight up for an hour, well, uh, the way people drive in Nevada, 45 minutes, 45 minutes. <laughs> we'd be in outer space like that. When I went to the World's Fair in 1965, 
there were three billion people in the world. They had a total board that showed three billion people. Today, there are over seven billion people. In my lifetime, it's more than doubled. That, combined with this thin atmosphere, is what is allowing our species to accidentally change the climate of a whole planet. So this debate was su such a big deal. And I'm sorry, you guys, just go on and on. I mean, I didn't expect it to be such a big deal. I was writing a book about energy with St. Martin's Press. And you meet a lot of people who don't, I, I don't want to trouble anybody, but watts are metric units. <laughs> uh, volts and amps are metric units. Uh, the last country in the world that doesn't use kilometers, we're sitting in it. And so I was writing a book about stuff like that. After the debate, St. Martin's Press, no, 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 you got to change, you got to change. We want you to write a book about evolution. And since I'm a, one of the world's foremost at what? Uh, <laughs> so, so I've been hustling, you guys, and this is the cover of the book that's supposed to come out the first week of November. Thank you. Wow, thank you guys. Undeniable, and then the featured words, evolution, science, the, the science of creation. Because once again, once you appreciate what I like to call our place in space, once you appreciate what an extraordinary set of events have led to you and me, it really, I hope, is humbling. And it frankly fills me with reverence. And I... I just consider every minute, every moment that I have on the earth to be precious. And I do my best to live my life, we all do, as, as best we can. So I really appreciate all your support. Now with that said, through a remarkable set of circumstances, I have not been killed in a plane crash. <laughs> but people have. And I want to just talk to you briefly as a former aerospace engineer who still has a license <laughs> about uh, flight Malaysia Air Flight uh, 370. Okay, there are 17 conspiracy theories as of this morning. As of this morning, I, or I guess it was last night I captured this image. Maybe there's another one now. Uh, to those of you who have a conspiracy theory about Flight 370, I will say, as I said earlier, you may be right. You may be right. Uh, but I don't think so. <laughs> I think it's much more likely that it was just a series of screw-ups. And I mention this because I understand this will be on the web. I may be wrong. You may be right. But I just want you to consider the following. Boeing 777s had some windshield problems about 10 years ago. There's a heater to keep the windshield from icing, and there was some wiring trouble, and they issued something called an airworthiness directive. And it, I'll tell you, I worked at Boeing. When there's an AD, as it's called, everybody, the phones start ringing, everybody's running in circles. My boss kept a luggage by his de desk packed, ready to go to any crash uh, when I worked on 747. Anyway, this was a serious thing, and it got addressed, but that, the, what looks like lightning in the upper right is actually the sparks from one of the failures uh, that the, the guys in the cockpit took with, uh, I believe, my understanding was, just with their uh, smartphone. And it was a serious thing, and it got addressed. It's possible, I'm not saying that's what happened, it's possible that the maintenance on MH370 wasn't done all the way up to snuff, or maybe things wear out. Now, this was the same crew that let uh, passengers in the cockpit. First to admit, these passengers have a certain look. <laughs> and they, this guy routinely let passengers in the cockpit, which is not permitted. And you're supposed to be watching the instruments and so on. Now let's say, hypothetically, the maintenance wasn't done quite so well. Or the guy, you know, when, you, when there's a mechanic on an airplane, there's another guy that watches him. That's all the other guy does. It's like. You talk, making jokes about unions and stuff, but when these so-called dual load path or flight critical or um, uh, safety of flight issues, 
There's a guy that watches the people work to make sure they're doing it properly. Anyway, maybe that wasn't done, right? Maybe he signed off the clipboard without really looking at it. Then maybe this crew let people in the cockpit while one of them was in the lavatory, so it was only one guy, and then there was a leak. And then the guy in the cockpit got asphyxiated. And then uh, in the electronics bay, the avionics bay, uh, back in my day, the limitation of aircraft electronics was how hot, especially the chips, the integrated circuits, could get. And there were only certain integrated circuits that were literally more spread out on their substrate uh, that were qualified for flight. But computer science moved, so, computer engineering moved so much qu more quickly than the avionics industry, a new approach was taken uh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, to make the cooling system especially redundant, to make sure the avionics stayed especially cool no matter what went wrong. And it's a strange thing at this high altitude when it's very cold outside, you don't get much cooling because you don't have enough molecules of air to pump through the thing. So if there's a catastrophic failure, things could, hypothetically, I'm not saying that's what happened, you may be right, uh, hypothetically things could overheat. And then the transponder would stop sponding. All right, and then this flight is, the people are looking for it now out in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Now, if you've ever been out there, it is the trackless ocean. You look any direction, any time, it all looks the same. I mean, to find something in this, in this environment is extraordinarily difficult. If you had a needle in a haystack, you could use a magnet, okay? But out there, it's just enormous areas uh, that are impossible or very difficult to uh, search in, with any speed. It takes a long time. So uh, this is a, one of the many websites describing this. It's a news story where the plane uh, were, is apparently had deliberate action, deliberate motions to avoid uh, Indonesian airspace. Uh, you may be right. But let me just emphasize there's a thing there. According to some reports, which to Jeannie's point is uh, some unconfirmed reports. <laughs> it may be nothing. So I propose to you guys that it wasn't, maybe not my scenario, but something, a series of things that went wrong. And what goes wrong with a modern airliner, in my experience as a young engineer reading accident reports, is maintenance. It's when the maintenance isn't done properly, that's the only thing that goes wrong with a modern airplane. And so, uh, of course, that's a writ large. That's what usually goes wrong. So I submit that it could be just a series of things that went wrong. Uh, but maybe, maybe there will be a, a, conspiracy, a conspiracy or maybe there will be evidence of foul play sometime. In the meantime, as you may know, uh, I um, went to Cornell University and right on Go Big Red, and I'm pretty confident that it was a series of clerical errors. <laughs> I mean, the people I went to school with are so freaking smart, but th through that process, through the sort of, I guess the university's got a lot to do, I stayed in, and I ended up in Carl Sagan's class in the back of the room. And uh, he talked at length about uh, the Tunguska event, which was um, this crash of something in Siberia. If you are here in Las Vegas and you have time, I encourage you to go to Flagstaff or Phoenix and drive to Meteor Crater, Arizona. If, if you've never been, it is amazing. It's, a, it's amazing, excuse me. Oh, by the way, don't worry, there's a Subway sandwich shop <laughs> right there. You park your car, you go up this thing, you go through the Subway sandwich shop, and there's a museum, they have some meteorites, very cool, some explanations of uh, cosmic collisions and things, and then there are these doors, and you go through these doors, and there's this hole! There's this huge hole! Like, whoa! It's a mile wide, over a kilometer, a kilometer and a half wide. And it's uh, about as tall as the Washington Monument. And so this is evidence of a meteor hitting the earth, and so I had Carl Sagan for astronomy, he talked about this, and then his kids, Sasha and Sam, watched the Science Guy show. I got invited to his house, uh, 
after he died, and I, was, uh, I spoke at his memorial service. It was very moving in Ithaca. Then I got asked to be on, on the board of directors of the Planetary Society, and uh, that was cool. Then I was vice president, and then four years ago, you know, I'll admit, you know, Neil Tyson's on the board, and uh, so is uh, Dan Jurassic. And these guys are really into wine. <laughs> they, and, uh, you know, they're collectors, you know. And so something happened. I left the room, and now I'm the CEO. I, I, don't, I'm not, I don't know what happened. Uh, so I, this is now my thing. And uh, the uh, Meteor Crater Arizona is really something about 25,000 years ago. The Tunguska event in Siberia was photographed a year, over a year after it occurred. And it, in my day, it was called the event. Now everybody calls it an airburst. So you know the story, like if you jump off the Golden Gate Bridge the, and you hit the water, it's like concrete and it will kill you. <laughs> well, that apparently is true. Uh, I've never tried it, but uh, apparently it's quite traumatic. And if you're a rock, or a piece of ice coming into the Earth's atmosphere, it's the same deal. The air can't get out of the way fast enough, and you explode. And you may recall, just a little over a year ago, a year ago in Chelyabinsk, Russia, uh, we had a bolide. A bolide is a fabulous Greek word. It means a meteor in the daytime. It's, that's, I don't know why we have a whole other word for it, but it's fabulous. <laughs> and uh, uh, there's so much insurance fraud in, in Russia, how much insurance fraud is there? There's so much <laughs> that uh, there's all these dashboard cameras captured this thing. And so then people go up to the windows, wow, look at the streak of the bull light in the sky. And then the sonic boom arrived uh, less, just a little under three minutes later, two minutes, 50 seconds or so, <laughs> blew the glass into so many people's faces. There are all these lacerations and stuff. And we, if I may, dodged a bullet or a bolide. Uh, we got lucky. And the Planetary Society, for many years, has been funding the search for these objects, near-Earth objects, NEOs. And that same 24-hour period, an asteroid that had been identified in 2012, 2012 DA-14, and DA is this fabulous system where they take the first two weeks of every month and give it a letter and so on. Uh, and that was another meteor, another object very, very large, would have been what we call them, what I like to say, they're city killers, counter kill, county killers, country killers, and then continent killers. This was somewhere between county and, and country, and it missed. So we at the Planetary Society advocate developing the means to deflect one of these things. Uh, and uh, this would be an extraordinary effort, taking people around the world to do this. And I was at TED. You know Ted, the uh, right on Ted, technology, entertainment, design, and I said, yeah, planetary side, we work to deflect asteroids. <laughs> no, no kidding. Uh, when I was in, um, well, I guess it was second grade. I had the same teacher for first and second grade, Ms. McGonigal, and she read from a book. I did. Uh, she read from a book. Uh, the ancient dinosaurs were killed because they had small brains. And the mammals took all their food, and they died. <laughs> and even she knew that was just lame. I mean, <laughs> come on. I'm a Tyrannosaurus. You are a rabbit. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Yeah. So there was a lot of trouble, you know, in geology. There are the, these formations, these volcanic formations in India. And they look like stair steps, and the Scandinavian word for step is trap. So uh, the Deccan traps and the Deccan, the Deccan stair steps of India, where there's big volcanism, atmosphere was troublesome, ancient dinosaurs having trouble, but then the meteor, uh, uh, that was in the earth. And uh, so it made a big noise, and that was trouble. But uh, now uh, we have a pretty good idea of what finished off the ancient dinosaurs. And I don't want to go that way. It's just not my thing. I don't want the Earth to get hit with an asteroid and end everybody's life. It sounds like a drag. Uh, red hot rocks, the ejecta from the thing was bigger than the diameter of the Earth, and dust went halfway to the moon. I mean, that's a big thing, and it wasn't an especially big rock. So what would we do about it? Uh, 
Uh, let me just start by saying you don't send Bruce Willis. <laughs> it's not that, I mean, he's a fine guy, very accomplished actor. It's just that that's not, you don't want to blow it up because you'll probably end up something going wrong. Some piece of it will still be headed the wrong way. And you can't guarantee you're going to blow enough of it up and so on. So we don't want to blow it up. Instead, we want to give it a nudge. Just a little push, just a little thing, a nudge. If an asteroid's going typically 20 kilometers a second, not a mile an hour, a sec, 20 kilometers a second, you want to deflect it about two millimeters, about a 10 millionth of its uh, momentum. So you, people have talked about, we'll land a rocket on there and we'll turn on the motor. <laughs> Except, uh, oh, shoot, it's in outer space, it's just. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> but would it have enough change in velocity, change in direction and speed to do it? Probably not, you probably can't carry enough fuel. People have talked about building a, a, um, a spaceship so massive, how massive would it be that it would have its mutual gravity, would just tug the asteroid off course, but even that scheme needs a huge amount of fuel. Uh, I mean, it would take a great deal just to move anything. So we at the Planetary Society are sponsoring this research where we're zapping uh, asteroid simulants, rocks, with lasers. And uh, it's in a vacuum. <laughs> and so uh, the ejecta, the stuff thrown off the rock, has enough, mo has a little more than we at first expected to give the rock a nudge. So what we would do is have these laser bees, the swarm of spacecraft out there that would take sunlight in solar panels and drive lasers and zzzz. And if the, all these objects are rotating or tumbling a little bit, you know, they're, they're primordial um, angular momentum, if I may. There's no, it, things just don't come together evenly. I mean, we're on a planet that spins, for crying out loud. And so um, if there's a pock mark or something that would mess up the laser, you just turn it off. So the thing's turning, bzzz, bzzz, bzzz. It's cool. It's a cool idea. So uh, I mention this because, uh, if, as CEO of the Planetary Society, if I could get the world to embrace this problem and do something, maybe not the laser bees, but do something about it, I mean, that would be pretty cool. The other thing I want to do as uh, CEO is uh, send a mission to Enceladus. Uh, hold it. Enceladus would be cool. But what I meant to say, and I've done this many times, I meant to say Europa. Enceladus is not in this view. I apologize. Uh, I'm just up here. I'm just so worked up, man. I also want to send a mission to Enceladus, but Europa is the moon of Jupiter that has more seawater uh, than the Earth. has about twice as much seawater as the Earth, and the water is kept liquid by the gravitational interaction of Europa and Jupiter. It's like squeezing a rubber ball. It gets warm. And so there's a layer of ice, and these geysers or plumes of ice crystals come squirting out of the fissures in the ice. What if there's something alive under the ocean, under the ice, rather, in the ocean, and we would fly through there and, like, look at the bugs on the windshield, you know? <laughs> the, I mention this because people who've talked about Europa have talked about... Uh, about the problem of having to land on the surface and then have a thermal drill and drill through 20 or 50 kilometers of ice to get to the... But no, you could just fly past it. 60 orbits, 30 orbits, you know, bzz, 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 pick up. And what if we found evidence of life for $2 billion? I mean, it would change the world. It would change the world. And so, yes! <laughs> I don't know who you are, but it would change the world. <laughs> yes. Yes, I love you, man, or woman. I can't see. When I was seven years old, I was a paper boy for the Washington Post, and I contacted Ripley's Believe It or Not, and they were very nice, and they said, yeah, we run this story once in a while. 
Insects which have been flying for some 350 million years defy the laws of aerodynamics. The bumblebee, considering its size and shape, is an aerodynamic misfit and should be unable to fly. <laughs> and so I'm a little kid. And I read this, and you know, it's grown-ups telling you stuff. And I went outside, the azalea bushes. My mom was very fond of the azalea bushes. And the bees fly fine. <laughs> no, our problem is with the theory, yeah? And so I mention this because there are got to be a hundred things, a thousand things, that each of us is certain of that are wrong. And we just got to be open-minded to this, and we have to say to the other guy, well, you may be right. And so I hope that we can get people excited about the process of science so that we can change the world. <laughs> now, this is a picture of the first 707 when it was still called the Dash 80. Every time you're on a de Havilland Dash 8, it's kind of a tip of the hat to the Dash 80. And if you look at this picture closely, there's an extraordinary feature of it. Uh, I wrote this upside down because the picture's upside down. It's actually like this. Now, I don't know how many airliners you all have flown on, but they very seldom do a barrel roll with them. But this guy, Tex Johnston, in 1954, did a barrel roll with a 707. <laughs> and he lands. And the bosses at Boeing say, I paraphrase. <laughs> Excuse me, Mr. Johnson. <laughs> and so the first thing he said was, I'm selling airplanes. And he affected that down holler, Chuck Yeager, right stuff thing. He was World War II veteran. I'm selling airplanes. And then he said, one test is worth a thousand expert opinions. And my friends, those are words to live by. Those words, thank you. Those words could, dare I say it, change the world. I had the great privilege of meeting Rick Smalley. Now, this is the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a picture of the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, I don't, you know, I tell you, I don't think it would even fit in this room, to tell you the truth, <laughs> big as it is. Uh, anyway, it's made of steel. And uh, Rick Smalley was one of the guys who discovered Buckminster Fullerenes, the Bucky Balls. And his dream was to take these spheres and stretch them indefinitely, where you make tubes that are 10,000 times stronger than steel weighing a sixth as much, and has said the key to the future is not to do less, which is what I was brought up on Earth Day. Do less, drive less, drink less clean water, wear dirty clothes, don't eat. <laughs> the key to the future is to do more with less. And I submit that if we pursue science, if we pursue innovation, especially what I always like to say, engineering, we will change the world and we will improve the quality of life for everyone. There is more wind in North Dakota. Uh, the energy in the wind of North Dakota is enough to power North America five times over. There's more sunlight in the Four Corners region of US uh, than we would need in North America if we just had a way to get it from there to where everybody needed it, if we just had a way to store it. Now, for several years, I've been in the electric vehicle community. I had the EV1, the electric vehicle one. I had the Mini Cooper electric. I was a test driver on the Volt, the Chevy Volt. I had the Nissan Leaf for three years. That is a great car. And I know, I know a guy who has a Tesla. <laughs> I know a guy. I know a guy. Uh, we could know a guy I went to college with. Uh, oh, right. Uh, one of the smart guys. And so if we could store energy in everybody's car, you know, the same way we know how many toilets flush at halftime, we know where everybody's car is. We could move energy around in this crazy efficient way. And people, especially at, in uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, are pursuing liquid metal batteries. 
These would be batteries that you let be hot on purpose. The limitation of electric vehicles is the batteries. They get warm and they lose their capacity. They can't hold as much oomph. But these batteries are molten metal. There's a layer of molten magnesium, a layer of molten table salt, and then a layer of antimony or antimony that's next to tin on the periodic table. And you could store energy. You wouldn't put it in cars. Liquid metal in cars, not your first choice. <laughs> but you'd have it maybe in the basement of every building in Las Vegas. And we'd store the energy there. Then we'd have a smart electrical get grid that the kids with their electric computer machines are going to figure out. And then we would send it around the world on carbon nanotubes. And this is where Rick Smalley said it's like the, electrician, the ele electron has a dream at one end of the tube, travels through, and wakes up at the other side with uh, no electrical resistance. If that were to come true, you guys, we could change the world. I was at, um, at the ceremony at, at uh, the Library of Congress where Carl Sagan's papers were uh, put into the archives. And at the same time, Carolyn Porco, who's a chief inve a principal investigator on the Cassini mission to Saturn, submitted this picture. This is a picture of the rings of Saturn as seen from the south, if you will, from below, uh, by human standards, from below them. And uh, it's a striking picture. The rings are extraordinarily thin. They have these wonderful colors. There are patterns, there are gaps in the rings that obey strict, fabulous mathematics, eigenvalues, and so on. But it's also, if you're not familiar with it, a picture of the Earth. The Earth is right there. And that's it. The Earth is that dot, that pinprick. If we could go up this way, 100,000 kilometers or so, the same view looks like this. And there's the Earth right there. So when I think about this, I cannot help but reflect on my third grade teacher, Mrs. Cochran, who told us there are more stars in the sky than there are grains of sand on the beach. And I just remember thinking, Mrs. Cochran, have you, have you been to a beach? <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't have expressed it, I wouldn't have said it this way, but um, Mrs. Cochran, are you high? <laughs> that, like, there's no way, lady. There's, when you're at a beach, there's sand everywhere. You look this way. I, I grew up uh, back east. We'd go to Delaware. You look this way, 1,500 nautical miles, 1,500. There's just sand. You look behind you, there's sand. You shuffle your feet, there's sand. When the tide goes out even a little bit, there's more sand. But there are, are apparently about a hundred times more stars than all of that, all over the world combined. And I remember thinking, looking at the night sky on the same trip, at all the stars, and thinking, you know, I am not that different from a grain of sand, really. I mean, if you're looking at me from out there, you can't see me. I'm just a dot, a speck, standing on the sand, which is a bunch of specks. I'm just a speck standing on a speck. A bunch of other specks. The Earth is a speck, right? Just a speck orbiting the sun. Completely unremarkable star. Nothing special about it. I'm a speck standing on a speck with a bunch of other specks orbiting a speck with other specks in the middle of specklessness. I suck. I am nothing. But my brain, which is only this big, I can use that to imagine all of this. My old boss, his brain. Okay. But with my brain, I can come to understand all of that. That's what we're here to celebrate, is the process and the body of knowledge of science, the way that we reason. That's what makes us different from so much of what's around us. That is how you and I, working together with an optimistic view of the future, can, dare I say it, change the world. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Oh, I love you guys. Thank you. Oh, thanks, you guys. Oh. Woo! Thank you. Wow. Bill Nye. Bill Nye. Bill Nye. 
Bill Nye. Nice suit. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thanks, awesome. man. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Wow. Everybody's got to get to dinner, right? We're busy and important. Uh, let me, if I may, leave you with this. Almost everyone who ever gambles loses. <laughs> okay, that's how it works. It is sobering to think that when you look at this room and this hotel and the strip and everything, there are a few $10,000 poker games, right? But most of it was just 25 cents at a time. Yes, 25 cents at a time. And then I'll buy a lottery ticket. The chances are only 230 million to one. So imagine a gun, an extraordinary revolver, with 230 million chambers. It would have 229,999,999 bullets in it and just one empty slot. <laughs> would you hold it to your head for a buck? I don't think so. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Bill Nye.